thank you everyone for joining us for this week's edition of Water Talks. Uh, we're going to be doing a comprehensive modeling basics in InfoWorks ICM. Um, just trying to show that uh, you know it's easier than than you may think. Um, your hosts for today are going to be Ryan Brown. He's a solutions engineer uh, here at uh, Innovise, and then I'm Hunter Sparks, also a solutions engineer at Innovise. We're going to start uh, building building a model here in InfoWorks ICM. Um, and one of the great features within InfoWorks um, is the ability to flag changes that users can um, set up on their own, that they have the ability to um, to flag different changes that they're making. And what's really nice about this is you actually have the ability to import and export your flags so that you're not having to manually create different ones across your um, uh, across your organization. Yeah, it makes it really easy to share these. Um, so, and it just comes in a common CSV format. Um, so you're able to bring all those in at once. And then it's always important um, to, oh, sorry. And then you are, uh, next we're gonna go ahead and uh, create an InfoWorks network. And so once that is created, we can go ahead and drag that and drop it and open it. And um, it's always important um, when you create a new network to make sure that you're setting the coordinate system. Um, this way you can make sure that the projections and everything that is being brought in um, is being brought in, uh, brought in correctly. And so we're gonna start building um, building the model and we're going to do that by importing um, some information that we already have saved. So we're going to go ahead and open the data import center. Um, and that's going to bring you to this screen, which allows you to import different um, items that can be brought into your model, whether it's nodes, conduits, uh, boundaries, sub catchments, um, and also gives you the ability to choose different, uh, different source types that can all be brought in to InfoWorks ICM. Um, for here, we're going to start with bringing in our nodes and conduits. So we're going to go ahead and navigate to uh, where we are saving our nodes. And so as we can see um, down here is we've got the object fields and then the import fields, which is the information that is tied to the file source that we're bringing in. And you can go down and you can choose individually to bring these in. But if it's a file format that you work with all the time, um, that you're bringing over, you can actually save configuration files. Um, and what this is going to do is it is actually going to map the different object fields to the import fields so that you're not having to do that manually over and over again. So as you can see, this brought in uh, 95 new objects and um, zero updates of existing objects because of course we had, we had a blank and none deleted or errors or warnings. And so now we're going to follow the same, the, the same workflow to bring in our conduits. And then we're just going to load another configuration file that is going to map those so that all that information can be brought in. Um, and and we, yep. we did get a question. Um, about the coordinate system and when it will be grayed out and not available. Um, so basically under, um, uh, let's see, tools and options. I don't know if you wanna show this under yeah. tools and options. Uh, if you go to GeoPlan, so you see we have the map control set as map extreme. If you had this selected as none, uh, then it would gray gray out and not be available. So, um, you know, it's just the it's it's kind of a third party add on type of thing. We we generally recommend using that as our map control. But if you don't have a map control set, then that's that's a situation where it would be grayed out. So, um, and then one about um, just if the presentation is being uh, shared or recorded, uh, we are currently recording, and so it will be uh, sent out to those attending. For sure. And then also links on our website. So sorry, keep going. <laughs> no, no, perfect. No, appreciate it. Yep. 
Um, so the next thing we're going to do is um, add some background GIS layers um, that you're able to bring in. And if you just right click and choose GIS layer control, as you can see, you can add WMS and also add um, feature layer files. And so we're going to bring in some address points, a grid, um, some road roofs, um, by just clicking, um, all, all, selecting all the ones and then opening them, as you can see, is bringing all of them in. This is where you can set whether they're visible, selectable, and as well, it's going to give you the give you the projection. Um, so as you can see now, we just added a little bit of information, um, some roads, uh, roofs, that kind of that kind of uh, information. Um, for now, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and turn those turn those off because we're going to concentrate more on the network. Um, but that is how you can just add a little bit more information to uh, to your to your model. Yeah, and not that we go over it, but there is some um, options in there. There is an add uh, WMS, which is map, web map service. Um, I'm not aware of there being a ton of them, but um, there is basically you if you have some. Um, um, web map services uh, available. Um, I can drop the one that I know of in the chat that works for the US, um, but it's basically like a base map adding that in. So I, I can take care of that, but it basically gives you a, a base map, background map um, for your stuff. Sorry, keep going. Perfect, perfect. No, <laughs> yeah. no, that's great, that's great. <laughs> Um, so uh, next, we're going to look at um, look at a section of these uh, pipes and conduits to see see what was brought in. We're going to look at this this long section here and go ahead and um, look at look at the profile. Um, and as we can see, which can happen with um, uh, when you're receiving information from other places and pulling it in, there's there's some data that's missing, um, some information that needs to be filled in. Um, you know, within this profile view, so you can see what kind of information is uh, whoops, is missing and uh, get a little bit more information out of these profiles. You can change the setting uh, to get a, uh, to add different information that you could be looking for within the uh, within the profile. So we're going to go ahead and add the ground level, and then for the conduits, we're going to do the upstream invert, the downstream invert, and then also the conduit width um, so that we can uh, see what kind of information you know might be missing and we might need to be pulled in. Um, and of course, you want to make sure that all of this information is in here before you run the model or of course you're gonna you're gonna run into some errors. And so in order to fill in that information that um, that is missing, uh, you can go ahead and create an inference tool within um, within Inforex ICM. And what this is allowing you to do is it's allowing you to set different information that it is going to infer. Um, so if you have missing ground levels, for example, um, if you're missing inverts. Um, and as you can see, it gives you a description of what it's going to infer as well as different parameters uh, that you're able to change. So I'm going to go ahead and check these off and do the ground level from addition node. And I'm going to do the head loss, the invert from gradients, that, and I think the interpolate. Um, and then those flags that we brought in, you can also set which flag that it is going to, uh, it is going to set those. And so we can save that. And one thing you wanna make sure, as you can see, we still have this long section um, selected. And if that is still selected, if you were to drag the inference, it would just fix the information on this, um, this stretch. So you wanna make sure that you're canceling out uh, what you're selecting so that you can run it on the whole, the whole model. And then this dialogue will come up asking you, you know, basically saying what we just talked about, how there's no current network selection. So do you want to continue on the whole network? So we're going to go ahead and say yes. And then now if we pull open this section once again, we'll see that 
it has, uh, it has inferred that information and filled in some of that information. And so the next thing that we're going to go ahead and do is uh, we're going to go ahead and validate the model. Um, you know, the validation is going to run through some uh, preset engineering validations. You can also set up uh, validations for it to check certain things. Um, and it's just going to spit out either errors, warnings for things that you might want to look out, and then some informational, um, informational dialogues that you might need to look into. You got a lot of warnings. You got a lot, a lot of more warnings than we were expecting. <laughs> I wonder if I chose the wrong inverse. Yeah, size and shape. You forgot size and shape. That's why it's asking for widths. So there, are, there are a number of pipes oh. that uh, didn't have uh, widths, but they might have had heights. Of course, if it's a circular pipe, the width is the same as the the height. So. Um, and then also, uh, you know, if you've got, um, you know, an 18 inch pipe, you don't know the pipe that's in the middle, and then you have another 18 inch pipe, it's pretty likely that that middle pipe is going to be 18 inches as well. So, because if you drag that on now, always fun to do it live, right? To, to show that the validation tool <laughs> is checking for the proper things. And as as we can see now, um, those those we're, sizes yeah, and we're just making sure you're doing it right. Hunter. That's right. <laughs> I'm not just back here, you know, doing nothing. I'm actually uh, I'm actually clicking the buttons. Wouldn't want it to go too too well. Um, um, we did have a couple of questions and things come in. Um, can we model uh, ERDIP pipes? And I admittedly had no idea what that was, but uh, looked it up real quick. It's earthquake resistant ductile iron pipe. Um, I'm, I'm not sure of like all the mechanics that maybe go into that, if there's some movement or something that has to be assumed or something, um, but assuming it's just the Manning's in type of thing, um, uh, certainly you could, you could definitely model any kind of pipe. It just depends on uh, how you get that set up within a, um, you know, Manning's, setting the correct Manning's into it. Um, if that's similar to ductile iron pipe, then that's pretty easy to look up. Um, Another one about um, will ICM replace InfoSewer when InfoSewer is uh, uh, discontinued? Um, yes, that is the, the goal and intention um, of Autodesk to centralize on one storm sewer flood uh, product. That's going to be uh, InfoWorks ICM. And, and that's part of the reason why we're here because uh, we, we've had this perception of ICM being difficult to learn or understand um, and just making it a little simpler in terms of explaining what some of the things are, uh, going into some basics about how to build a model. So, um, yeah, I'll let you keep going on. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. And this is, this is what we're expecting the, uh, validation to, to spit out with this model. Um, as we can see, we do have, we do have an error, this code that's in, uh, in red saying that the value is too small. So um, the inference set the minimum length of a pipe to 3.3 feet. And as we can see, it is highlighted one that is, uh, is shorter than that. So if we open this up, it is also going to tag it in this column, uh, letting you know what the validation message is, flagging it red. And then as we can see, of course, the length is is three feet instead of 3.3 feet. So it's something that you might want to look into um, uh, in order to have this, this model run. Um, yeah, well, this is a situation that it, it needs to be corrected. Yeah. Uh, so the idea here is, you know, if anyone's done a lot of modeling and, and brought in every single little pipe that you know, is within a network. Um, sometimes it's unpractical to uh, have a solution solve the uh, St. Venon equations in those areas. So you can get a lot of instabilities and things like that. So um, generally what we see, and I, I guess you can keep going on her, um, but to uh, combine things. Yep. And we're going to go ahead and, uh, and combine them, like Ryan said. Uh, sometimes it'll bring in this information and it just, it's, realistically that's not that's not what's going on um so uh, we're going to go ahead and get rid of that conduit and what we're going to do is we're going to match the end of this pipe and have it go to this conduit so as we can see it's 6580 so we're just going to copy that into the upstream node and see it's going to go ahead and connect it and then 
we're going to go ahead and grab the um, downstream invert and we're going to go ahead and make that the upstream invert for for this value um, and then we're also going to want to change the length to default and what that's going to do is that's going to pull in the length um, as you saw it was 46 so this updated it to the actual uh, 48.3 and then we can just go ahead and get rid of uh, get rid of this node um, because there's nothing nothing attached to it. And so now that we have this model um, in here, um, you know, ready to go, we, we want to make sure that we're bringing in the area um, that is going to be used for uh, for making the run, um, and eventually is going to be brought in to uh, create the subcatchments. So we're going to go ahead and go back to our um, uh, the import center, and this time we're going to bring in a polygon, and this is just going to follow the same steps that we went through. Oops, sorry, we went through for the last one, um, and then we're going to go ahead and load a configuration file. As we see, that's going to map the ID, and one object was brought in. And so as we can see now, um, our entire area was brought in. And this is basically just representing the kind of sewer shed area for, um, for this model. Um, so, yeah. And that's, that's, you know, good information to have, to have the overall, um, the overall shed area. But, you know, what we really want to do is break this down into sub catchments that are going to each node. Um, and you have the ability to do that. So we're going to go ahead, go to model, sub catchments, and we're going to create within the selected polygon. And we're going to go ahead and change this to foul. Press OK. And now we can see that it took that polygon and broke it down into different sub catchment areas. Um, and it's based on the centroid. Um, the center of that area going to going to the closest node. So this would probably be more applicable in situations for sewers and not necessarily stormwater. Um, as you can imagine, you know, a contributing subcatchment to a node would likely be, you know, the I and I that comes from that subcatchment, whatever's closest to it. Um, so that's kind of the idea here. Um, you could maybe do something like this for like a quick and dirty uh, stormwater thing, but um, but yeah. No, that's a great that's a great thing to to point out. Um, and now that we have those sub catchment areas, um, we no longer need need this polygon. Um, so we can go ahead and delete that out, and those sub catchment areas are still are still going to be stay uh, are still going to stay there. Yeah, I, I was going to take a break here for a couple of questions that have come Perfect. in. Um, could you have moved the node and stretched the pipe to 3.3 feet to be more realistic? Um, you know, instead of um, going in, yeah, I, I see what you mean to, to kind of give it a bend uh, to it. So you to to accurately represent that like uh, link, I guess you could do it two ways. You could uh, measure out that area and then change the length of that length to um, something that would represent that bend. Um, some other things that you could do, you can add in vertices. So up at the top where you can insert nodes manually uh, over to the right side, there's a edit geometry. So you can edit um, the geometry of a link. So you could add in a vertex. Um, if you aren't aware of how to add in vertexes, it's a little cryptic in my opinion. <laughs> um, so you'd have to select the, um, edit geometry and then when you select on an object uh, control adds a vertice and then if you hold down alt and then click a vertice it'll uh, remove that um, so that's that that would be how you'd represent that you'd, you'd add in the vertice using that holding down control and clicking on the the item and then dragging it over um, Maybe you want to think about some additional head losses or something like that through the through the pipe as well um, to be able to represent that just by uh, changing some of the coefficients. But um, yeah, it, it, it comes down to modeling technique and um, that type of thing to make that uh, more represented. Um, got another question about um, 
ICM only being sold to companies and not users. Um, I, I guess I apologize if there was some sort of misunderstanding, but users could always purchase ICM. Uh, it just was typically that companies were the only ones interested and had the money to be able to purchase it. So um, that's that's kind of where it came down to in terms of um, being able to uh, get sold to people, but anyone can purchase it. Um, now that we're a part of Autodesk too, uh, there are resellers um, that are out there too that can um sell the product too. So um, if you have channel partners or um, dealers that you typically go through to purchase um, Autodesk software, uh, then you can purchase uh, Innovise software through those same channels now, or you should be able to, I guess not all the channel partners have been certified, but um, there, there've been at least a dozen or so. Um, I guess we have another question about InfoSewer and being able to directly import um, that into ICM. Um, unfortunately, no, that's that's one of the um, storm sewer flood softwares that doesn't have a import routine directly like InfoSwim does and XPSwim does. We did some earlier webinars during the beginning of the year uh, to show the uh, that import process of those two types of models. Uh, InfoSewer is just kind of different in terms of the inputs that it has and what it looks like. Um, generally the recommendation, and I, I know that the support and product teams are still kind of working on some documentation and things like that, but the uh, the idea is going to be to rebuild um, the, the info sewer model in um, ICM either as a swim network or very likely as a swim network since that would be more similar, uh, but to rebuild it from the database files. Um, uh, to, to basically go back through those and, and add in data via, um, you know, updating via CSV and, and things like that to be able to, to help with that. Um, can the subcatchments be manually modified after they're generated? Yes, absolutely. Same, same idea with modifying the pipe, being able to uh, add in vertices, uh, manipulate the vertices using that, um, using that edit object geometry uh, tool. Um, and same idea for adding in and removing vertices. Um, uh, does subcatchment regenerate automatically if you add a new pipe or node? No, you'd have to walk through that um, that routine again of delineating the, the sewer sheds and then um, kind of a similar vein. Is there any audit delineation tools similar to other softwares where you can use a DEM or ground model to find uh, storm catchments? Uh, no, not quite, unfortunately. Um, I, I wish there was a little more functionality in terms of leveraging that type of thing. Um, I do know one of our legacy products, InfoSwim, has something that's very similar to that, uh, but it takes advantage of the uh, spatial analyst tool within ArcGIS. Um, and while you can set a coordinate system and everything like that in ICM, and have some projection capabilities, uh, it's not really a, a true GIS system. So um, that, that's that's where it's uh, a little bit limited in, in that. Um, I guess you could probably come up with some routine within um, Spatial Analyst uh, to uh, delineate subcatchments because that's essentially what InfoSwim does. Um, but I, I don't have um, a good work through for that uh, currently. Um, will ICM take a utility network from Esri? You know, they're getting more, more of this. Um, uh, as long as that, I guess if it's like a certain type of database, you can uh, link to SDE, um, SDEs, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I, I think that's a little more of the like geometry networks, um, but you can ingest shape files just as we're showing here. So as long as you can get to the point of a, a shape file, um, that, that's typically the best way to get stuff from Esri into uh, InfoWorks. Um, sorry if I missed the question, but uh, is the presentation going to be recorded? Yes, it, it will be shared and record. It is being recorded right now, so we'll, we'll share it after it. And uh, how good is it to design sewer networks using InfoWorks ICM? Um, so there's no, there's fewer um, kind of out of the box tools uh, within InfoWorks ICM, but um, as we'll show 
uh, I guess in a little bit here, um, there are uh, SQL queries that can be used. And so you can um, potentially use that capability to do some automation in terms of sizing and things like that. Um, so um, so there, there's a way to do it, but it's not like out of the box. Um, if, if you have a particular need or something like that, we can maybe set up another meeting or something like that and, and walk through things. Um, Uh, You're just flying it. Yeah, <laughs> there's a ton <laughs> of questions coming in. Um, is it possible to demonstrate the WMS? Yeah, so we're going to hand it off at some point to me, and I can um, show briefly um, what, what that looks like. Um, and then is the only format shape files. How about uh, feature classes coming from a, a geodatabase? Um, so yes, there is the capability of linking to a enterprise geodatabase, um, but you do need to have Arc Map installed on your computer because it does uh, utilize that. The other thing is um, within the map settings that we were showing earlier with the options uh, under GeoPlan, there are some. Uh, other map control options of ArcGIS desktop and ArcGIS engine. Um, so you would need to uh, select one of those as your map control to be able to then interact with uh, geodatabases. Oops, I need to do that. Um, do you want to keep going or there's a couple more yeah, questions, but I've, we can, I, I've got, to keep the I've got two going. more. Yeah. <laughs> I've got, I've got two more steps and then I can pass it to you and then I can, uh, I can go ahead and monitor, monitor the chat and let you, uh, let you do your thing. <laughs> All right. Um, and the one question, like Ryan said, that was a good, uh, a good transition was, um, setting up, uh, SQL queries, um, by, uh, for new InfoWorks and then doing a stored query, um, in this case, we are going to um, set some of the flags uh, to to set to a certain value. Um, for this instant, we're going to be working with subcatchments, but as you can see, you can uh, set up SQL queries for you know a lot of different items like conduits, flumes, flow velocities. Um, a lot of really good, uh, really good tools here. Um, uh, subcatchments and there's also a builder that can help you where you can put constants arithmetic text and comparisons in order to build this out um, so what we're going to do for this one is we're going to set the contributing area flag we're going to equal it to in this case we're going to do g for uh, geo view and then we're also going to set the population flag equal to G as well. Um, it's always good to test these um, just to make sure it has a valid syntax. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and save that so that we can use it later. And you could run it here. Um, and then you can also just drag and drop. And then if we go ahead and open one of these uh, sub catchments, as we can see now, that contributing area that we pointed it to is now has a G and then also has um, a G for the population. Um, as we can see here, the population is set to zero. Um, and we're going to go ahead and walk through um, how, you can, how you can change that uh, so that can be used for the dry weather flow. Um, before I did that, Ryan, I wasn't sure if there's anything you wanted to add on the SQL uh, queries, or sorry, on the queries. No, I just, uh, you know, they can be used across different um, model networks. So you can certainly build out libraries and things like that. But uh, any kind of tedious task or, um, you know, the flags are a good example because those are difficult to bulk change in the in the tabular uh, view. But um, there, there are some bulk editing tools like if you're just wanting to like multiply all the areas or all the impervious areas by a certain percentage, then uh, you could you, you could do a bulk edit for that, but you could also use a SQL query uh, to help with that as well. Um, but yeah, that, that's pretty much it. Great. Yeah, those SQL queries are, you know, can be can be really powerful to use. Um, so, so as mentioned, we're going to go ahead and uh, set the population uh, for these subcatchments, and we're going to do that uh, from address point counts, and we're going to do it from a file, and we're going to go back and choose uh, those address points, and then 
Um, what we're going to do is we're going to do it a fixed and put 2.8. And what we're saying here is that uh, you have an average of 2.8 uh, people living, um, yeah. living and, at the address points. And this is where the flag becomes important. I mean, it's it, yep. the flags applied to all the subcatchments, but um, this is where you could differentiate between which subcatchments you want to populate for that population and which ones you don't. Um, a little less you know applicable for for us in this situation we don't necessarily need one but um just as an example of of a way to do it um but if yeah i, I guess keep going but uh yeah. <laughs> i mean basically this is uh if i don't know if you want to turn on the address map layer again oh yeah um but basically what this is doing is is looking for those address points and, and whatever, however many number of points were within the uh, subcatchments that we have here uh, is multiplied against that that uh, 2.8 that um, Hunter was showing earlier in, in populating. So now we can see that the population in these subcatchments is, um, does have a number to it. Now that was, yeah, that was a great, great description of what's going on there. Um, and then, you know, now would be, uh, you could run a validation, uh, cleaned that up, and then you could uh, commit the changes uh, to the master database. Um, and at this point, Ryan, I am gonna go <laughs> ahead and pass it on to you. Good, good. Let's, let's see. This is always the most nerve wracking part, right? Yeah. Uh, so, yes. And all right, am I up? Yep, we can see yours now. And I know we had some chat and stuff going on. Um, yeah, yeah, I think the last another screen. I think the last one, um, this one about uh, if this is looking to uh, replace info sir and what is the main difference in the two programs um I, yeah. I can answer the first one that yes that is that is the goal moving forward um is to have this replace info sewer um and then the main differences in the two programs ryan if you want to yeah um i mean the biggest difference in my opinion is uh the engine of course the interface um is a lot different you had uh i don't know I hope that goes away soon. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, the biggest difference, I think, is the engine that, that solves um, solves the equation. So uh, InfoSewer uses a Muskingum Kunj method. Uh, InfoWorks ICM uses a you know a fully implicit solution of the St. Venon equations. Um, the Muskingum Kunj method is a, a simpler methodology to come up with a solution. Uh, because of that, it, it can produce uh, conservative results, especially if you get into uh, surcharging and um, you know pipes that become under pressure. Um, so uh, there's there's certainly that and. Um, so that, that, in my opinion, is probably uh, the biggest difference. There's no steady state option with InfoWorks ICM. Uh, you could develop something that would um, get it to run into a steady state, but there's no true steady state um, condition or, or run simulation. Um, got a lot of questions about um, the population tool yeah. and using that. Um, I'm not exactly sure what census block data looks like, um, but I do know, I, I guess, kind of in the next question here is, can address points be made from building outlines, GIS shapefiles? Um, in, in that situation, I would use GIS to, um, uh, there, I think there's a routine to do polygon to points. Uh, and so it'll come up with a point that's in the middle of the building um, and then use that as your address points. Um, and then I, I guess kind of alongside with that is population really households. Uh, yes and no, that's what that 2.8 um, number that Hunter put in uh, was representative of is where we're assuming that there's an average of 2.8 people in each one of the households. Um, and then basically the number of points that were within each one of the subcatchments um, are now uh, being multiplied against 2.8. And then that's what goes in and serves that. Um, got some questions about H2S and the uh, water quality. Yes, uh, there are um, 
it's a little more in the weeds in the depths of things, but Infowords definitely has the capability of modeling um, uh, water quality, including H2S in it. Um, got another follow up with the arc map and it being phased out and you know being only a, a pro shop. We uh, unfortunately don't have a, a fantastic solution for you right now. Uh, if you are only on pro, that um, that the workaround that we currently have is to just export out from the GDB to a shapefile and import that into uh, Infoworks ICM. Um, we're, we're, we're definitely well aware that ArcMap is being phased out and that more and more users are switching over to um, switching over to a um, pro the pro platform uh, and so we're um, that, that's something that's in development um, at, so, at some point uh, in the future um, gosh where am I um, <laughs> uh, I think will ICM have an automated tool to do verification process maybe Ruby or Python script is it something which the live version has or will have yeah um I mean, the closest thing that I think we could get to that is being able to compare things and maybe go through some iteration processes or something like that of like increasing the Mannings in 0 0.01 and then rerunning the simulation or something like that and continuing through that process. I think the fortunate, unfortunate thing of that is that verification calibration processes still require some level of uh, engineering judgment. Um, uh, and that, you know, some tools could be built with SQL queries or Ruby to help with that, but it's not going to do it for you necessarily. Um, is the steady state function anticipated? Um, no, not really. Uh, the, the solution that we kind of have going for that is to uh, move things to a, um, move things to like a cloud environment. So, um, more simplistic types of analyses and routines like the steady state. Um, we'd likely just have some sort of module within uh, a cloud platform rather than a desktop modeling uh, platform. And then where do you apply the flows for those outside points? For, oh, for the address. Mm -hmm. I think we're just, I think we're just being sloppy to be honest. Yeah, so we're just being sloppy and didn't include these. <laughs> so you could, I'd, I'd probably expand out some of the areas, but um, just the data that we had, um, that's how it worked out. So, um, you know, these could also be a part of another system and it just got brought in because it's a part of a generalized file for this area, um, different ideas like that. And then I think the last one, uh, can you create one big catchment area upstream from a node, e.g. community pipes flowing to a head works? Oh, um, sorry, I was trying to find the question. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course, you can definitely uh, create one big catchment area for, you know, we have, we have a lot of people who do that for, um, planning uh, level efforts. So, you know, if a developer comes to you and says, I want to build 500 homes in this area, can you handle it? Or what do we need to do to upsize things? So you could create one large catchment to represent those five, 500 uh, nodes and just have it all uh, going to, you know, the one point where you're going to make that connection. Um, then, so, yeah. And then another about recording. We yeah. are recording. <laughs> we will It'll be sent it out. out and, uh, and everyone will have it. Um, I did want to, I guess, start out with the web map service. So um, as you can see here, I've got kind of this background map. It is kind of sluggish, um, this web map service in, in general. Um, I should take some more time because uh, it is something that people seem to be interested. You can see it's pretty grainy, but you can still tell that, you know, you've got roads and there's a building output and things like that um, within this. But this is all, um, again, controlled through the GIS uh, layer here. Um, and it's just a matter of hitting the add uh, WMS. And then the link that I sent out earlier, I do want to clarify that there's a question mark at the end that did get included with the um, that URL. But that should be a part of the um, 
a part of it. Um, so if I go into properties, I can see what basically the that URL is. So you can see that question mark is in there. Um, and then you have some different options for turning things off and on. Uh, so hopefully that, that pretty much covers things with that. And with that, I'll, um, I'll keep going. Um, so uh, this is uh, basically the same place that uh, Hunter dropped off at. Um, we're uh, just sharing these through transportal databases, but um, but the idea here is I was hoping to get something set up on a server and we could do this a little more seamlessly, but um, didn't have a chance to do that. There we go. Um, I'm, I'm still up, aren't I, Hunter? Yep. Yep. Okay. We okay. can see, we can see the model. Good to go. Um, so the next part here is, uh, we're going to utilize the, uh, roof and road, uh, to get a better idea of the impervious area. So basically these are representing, um, spaces that are either buildings or roadways and, um, because we're doing this as an absolute um, runoff area, um, we're just gonna calculate basically within these different uh, land use uh, runoff areas, how much of it is impervious. So uh, going up into model and subcatchment, we've got this area takeoff um, option. So I can select the uh, road roof file. Um, I'm just gonna look at the status and the status is basically, a, um, if I were to actually look at the, um, and this is arc map, so forgive me for being archaic, but um, if you look at the properties and the status, uh, each one of the statuses is just basically representing what R stands for road, and then I think it's like BR or RR or something like that, representing the buildings, yeah, uh, BR representing buildings. Um, so if I have all that on, I have my flag identifier as what I've um, selected things on. I've got three different surfaces in here, the R, the BR, and then everything that's not one of those. Um, so if I hit OK, uh, you can see that once that goes through, it's going to update those um, the uh, those runoff areas with what's uh, applicable. It's going to give me some summary information of um, what's going on and, and what it did for uh, areas that might have been overlapping. Um, in, in how it solved those um, spaces. Um, so that's that's telling me, you know, which areas um, are correlated to which. If I hit the uh, engineering validation, um, it's gonna give me um, an error saying that I need to update the uh, runoff. So within the subcatchments, there are these land uses. I don't have any populated except for the default value for this number one value. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is uh, something that's, I think, a really nice feature. It kind of starts to uh, give you the capability of building out uh, some templates and things like that. So um, just to show, uh, I guess, the back end of what this looks like, um, I'm going to end up updating from a CSV um, this information. And so um, as you can see here, there's uh, some settings uh, for the simulation parameters. There are um, uh, ways to set up defaults for different database objects. So um, if you've ever watched one of the, uh, the Ruby, um, Ruby ones that we, uh, web webinars that we've done, um, this is basically the name uh, that we, you would use. So you could go to our website and there is a uh, kind of Ruby resources and it uh, highlights what, you know, the, the different object names are. Uh, what the different uh, kind of database items are. So um, at the same time, you could also um, export from CSV or export to a CSV uh, to get a similar kind of idea for what the field name should be, what the um, uh, object uh, database should be. Uh, but I'm going to go in right here now and uh, update and add. Everything uh, kind of looks good for, um, you know, updating based on, um, you know, a certain flag. Um, if I hit OK, then that's where I just go in and uh, find find the CSV. Uh, so if I hit Open, 
Um, it's going to bring me back to this dialog, but I just hit cancel to get out of everything. Um, and it's going to tell me what things were modified, what things were created, uh, created some new land uses. And so now if I go back into the subcatchments at the land use, um, all these orange ones, as you can see, the flags have all been updated. Um, and all the information as far as um, what kind of impervious area um, those different uh, percentages would would relate to uh, um, and, and the connections and everything like that. So um, I guess, uh, yeah, so lastly, we need to set up some uh, flow information uh, before we uh, do make a run. Uh, delete that. Um, so in here it can be pretty simple to do um rainfall event there we go um so you can make your own but i'm gonna do a, a generated rainfall design just to, for simplicity um got the uh scs method here um in this dialogue uh, i'm gonna choose type two um because that's probably the most common in the us um and just do something like five inches of rain uh, over that 24 hour period you can open these as uh, a grid editor. It is a, a read only, but um, you can open that up to get an idea of what uh, what the storm event looks like. Uh, and then you can also open it as a uh, a graph too to see what the um, the rainfall intensity over that period it looks like. Um, the other thing that we're going to need is the dry weather flow. So. Uh, InfoWorks networks are a little bit different than their swim network counterparts in that uh, there's kind of an extra component to uh, the profile. So uh, the, that's the wrong one. Um, I've already got a pattern saved. Typically these factors uh, will, yeah, so here's my, my pattern that I've already got saved in an Excel file just to kind of help speed things up. Um, but the idea is that pattern is, is developed from some sort of flow survey data. I'm just going to make one uh, residential, if I can spell. Um, I'm just going to make one profile, but you can have up to 999 if you want. Um, so I'm just going to make the first one, but you would typically have a different wastewater profile for different types of land uses. The uh, profile here, uh, this factor is supposed to average out to one over the period of time, but representing the diurnal uh, curve and pattern going on there, um, where we don't have a lot of flow uh, during the middle of the night. We have a lot of flow when people are waking up and taking showers, don't have as much in the afternoon. And then um, again, when, when people are coming home and, and doing stuff. So. Um, so basically that factor during that time period gets multiplied against this per capita flow per day. Uh, and then what uh, Hunter was showing with uh, updating that population parameter, um, that then gets multiplied against the uh, population in that catchment. And that's how it comes up flow for the day. Um, this is in cubic feet per day. Um, uh, 17 is, is roughly uh, 130 gallons a day. Um, pretty typical for uh, what you would expect to see in a system. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and validate, make sure that everything uh, is good. Uh, and then I'm going to commit the changes. So um, I'm gonna name it something applicable, like complete model. Um, and then from there, it's just as easy as setting up a run. Uh, and in here, I can just do initial run drag over my database objects. Um, you can reuse these. So you have the option of updating the latest. So if you're going in and making modifications and you want to rerun the simulation, you can uh, simply hit this update to latest. You also have the option of allowing reruns uh, using the updated network. So uh, if you don't have this checked and you run the simulation again, it's going to create a new, um, a new run file uh, if you do update the, the model. Um, other things that we need, uh, we got some rainfall. You don't necessarily need rainfall if you just want to look at dry weather flows, uh, but wastewater would be the other uh, parameter in there. Um, as far as start times, um, I'm just going to make something up uh, as far as the date goes. Uh, there is a time step in here for, um, you know, your, your 
uh, convergence criteria. Uh, 60 seconds is the default. It is variable, so it's going to uh, look for some stable uh, conditions and enable to um, still meet the, the CFL conditions. Um, so, you know, usually 60 seconds is perfectly fine uh, for a 1D simulation. And then the results time step multiplier. So we're getting results every five minutes. Um, you have some options here for how long you want it to run. I'm going to run it for two days. Um, and I'll we'll just hit run and um, run it on this computer. Um, you can click on this to see uh, what the job progress looks like. Um, this can be good, especially if you're running into convergence issues where things might be failing, uh, where the nodes fail or where the links fail. Uh, it can give you an indication of uh, where stability problems might be occurring. So um, we've, we've gone ahead and ended. And um, next week is where we're going to really take a deep dive into the uh, results and analysis and, and what we can do there and how we can kind of take things to the next level. Uh, but just as an example, um, just to see the, the fruits of our labor, um, just looking at flow, uh, you can see here that I've got a lot of response from this, this storm event. I've got some movement uh, whenever there's um, dry weather flows um, throughout the network. Have a good one, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye.